Hello, and welcome to Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Kate Harper of the 61st District in Montgomery County. Our veterans have given so much of themselves to defend our safety, defend our freedoms, and preserve our democracy. Recently, I hosted a breakfast and an expo that provided an opportunity to bring these men and women together, thank them for their service, and offer them the opportunity to explore programs and services available to them. Congressman Pat Mann, veteran Joe Rooney, and Nancy Becker, our recorder of deeds, spoke to the audience that day. I'd like to share portions of their remarks with you now. The truth is, I'm not a veteran. My dad was a World War II veteran, my father-in-law served in the Korean War, my grandfather was in World War I, and my son Paul is with the Marines right now at Camp Lejeune. So allow me to say, I am honored to be in your company. Humbled to be in your company because I really feel that you did it for me. So thank you very much, all of you veterans, for making it possible for, uh, for me to live in, in the greatest country on earth. And um, I'm proud to know you. Now, um, this morning we are here as a guest of the Montgomery County Community College, which is also a friend of veterans. So I'd like to ask Peggy Lee to come on up. And, um, and just welcome you here. I see my old friend, Amory Donahue. Hello, Amory. Amory Donahue is a professor here at uh, Montgomery County Community College and also a good friend of veterans. And uh, Peggy Lee Clark's um, the Director of Government Relations and Special Projects here at the college and veterans and Kate Harper are all pretty special to her. Thank you, Representative Harper. It's great to be here. On behalf of Dr. Karen Stout and the Board of Trustees of Montgomery County Community College, we are very proud to have Representative Harper and Congressman Meehan here today to really um, talk about and have some fellowship with the veterans. Um, we saw an increase in our veteran population in 2008 and have done a lot through services, not only through tuition benefits, but with the great work of Dr. Anne-Marie Donahue and our uh, support systems here at the college, including an advisor who is designated George Panabaker to work with our veteran students. We've done a lot of work in that area and we're very proud to do so. We think that it's important that we offer uh, not only tuition advice, but also um, support services to make sure that students complete their goals and certainly veteran students complete their goals. So very happy to be here. We, are, uh, we have been acknowledged uh, for three years in a row as a military-friendly college, and we're very proud of that fact. And I know that this is just going to be a great morning for all of you, and we're happy to have you here. Thanks. Congressman Pat Mann. Uh, Congressman Mann got to Congress after being U.S. attorney in this area. Some of you might remember his more famous prosecutions, Senator Fumo and others. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But he was a guy wearing the white hat on that. And then he went to Congress and um, almost immediately became involved as chairman on uh, Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, which is a big job for a freshman. Now, um, some of you know that uh, freshmen are usually 18 years old, but in Congress that's not true. So he actually came to the job with quite a bit of experience. Congressman Meehan helped us um, get some of the groups that are here today because, of course, on the federal level, um, they are so concerned with taking care of our veterans, uh, new veterans and old veterans. And I'm, I'm very pleased that he was able to find time in his schedule to come and be with us today. Congressman Mann? I thank you on behalf of a grateful nation, as they say, for all of the veterans uh, who are serving currently, uh, serving our country, and who have served our country uh, in uniform. And, and, and Kate, while you have identified that you uh, did not serve, uh, but clearly as the parent of Marine, uh, I think that is the kind of uh, the greatest service uh, that our nation can give to, to, to be the parent at home, I suspect in many ways, is, uh, is almost more difficult than to be the uh, service member uh, themselves. But thank you for not only your continuing commitment, but thank you for taking the time to pull this very, very important uh, gathering together. 
And it's probably no more important now than, in, than at any other time because what we're seeing as we transition out of our commitment that we have made an extensive commitment overseas now for over a decade, we are seeing uh, more and more veterans who have served their country with distinction and are now returning here and looking for the opportunity to transition back into their roles in which they can continue to contribute to our country uh, in a meaningful way. We're here today and I think no more appropriate place than an educational, the Montgomery County Community College, like community colleges throughout. Uh, and there has been a, a, a great deal of support in Congress to make sure that there's a continuing support and recognition for the continuation of the concept of the GI Bill. Those who have served certainly have the opportunity to take advantage of the support that they will get to come back and continue uh, their education. And as a result, it is critical that these kinds of connections be made so they understand not just the opportunities that they can get to have support, but the many things that are being done in the community colleges uh, and other uh, you know, post-secondary institutions that allow people to take advantage of, of, of the skill set that they have earned from their service uh, in, in the military. Uh, a second thing that I have been working on, along with numbers of my colleagues, uh, has been the idea of creating more and better utilization of what we call transition assistance. And that is taking the existing organizations, the Department of Labor, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Defense, who all have a tendency to work in their own silos and doing a lot more to make sure that they're collaborating on their efforts to, to be one-stop service centers for the veterans and enabling them to make the transition. So in addition to being able to get the support for the kinds of things that they need from, say, the Veterans Administration, there's also one-stop shopping for this important opportunity for them to, to re reconnect. And in fact, I'm working with Senator Toomey and we'll be dropping a bill when I come back uh, when we start early next week to support legislation that Senator Toomey uh, introduced on the Senate side and I will be working with him to introduce it on the House side. And the purpose of that legislation is going to be to require the Department of Labor to work with the Veterans Administrations to do what we call one-stop opportunities for online assistance so that the Department of Labor will set aside exclusively for veterans the ability to come in and get counseling on one-stop places in which the Department of Labor will be responsible for scouring what is out there in the cyber world in terms of opportunities for anybody, but identifying how they connect back to the kinds of skills that have been developed by veterans. Let me use for an example, if you had been a helicopter mechanic during your service period, now you return, you're back here in this area, and suddenly we have people down at Boeing that are looking for particular kinds of skill sets. Or over here, you know, where the old Sikorsky thing, up on Chester County, in which you've got very unique skill sets. Well, the veterans DOL would be identifying that work opportunity and connecting it back to that skilled veteran to make sure that that connection is made through the Department of Labor. The idea would be as well that there would be an opportunity to have the skill sets identified and the resume development that can be utilized to help that veteran have support as they go out and make connections to employers. So I think that is the kind of assistance that helps that veteran because the second piece of what's going on is there are incentives right now that Congress has voted for and I don't think employers appreciate enough the current tax credits that are in place, particularly as we look at those who are out of work. There's tax credits now for $2,400 if you hire a veteran. Uh, and if it hires a veteran who's, been, who's out of work for uh, what is it, more than four weeks and less than six months. If you hire a veteran that's been out of work for more than six months, that tax credit can go all the way up to $4,800. And that's a significant advantage to an employer.
who may be looking to expand and give the preference to those, again, who have served. For disabled veterans, it's even more significant. It's up to $9,600 of the tax credit if that disabled veteran has been out for more than six months. So we want to encourage employers to understand the opportunity that they have to give a preference uh, to a veteran. Uh, we have also worked on legislation. Congressman Mike Fitzpatrick introduced this legislation, and I've been pleased to be part of this, in which we already have certain kinds of categories of preference, so to speak. And, and, I, and I think that there are certainly appropriate occasions where it ought to be appreciated that you give a preference, say, to a, to a, a women-owned business to be able to compete for federal contracts. And a certain set percentage of those need to go to a women-owned uh, business. Well, uh, this legislation suggests that uh, if you are a veteran-owned business, you will have exactly the same opportunity to be included in that preference. And I think that is entirely appropriate and a way in which uh, the veterans can be, uh, can be rewarded uh, for their service, particularly the opportunity to compete for uh, the tremendous amount of uh, federal dollars uh, that are out there. So those are the kinds of things that I think are really important in trying to help us make the reconnection so that those who have served can take those skills and utilize them uh, in a way in which they can create the kind of career and, and develop the, the, the family-sustaining job, uh, as, they, as they say, that can help them, uh, help them grow and contribute uh, to, to, to our society. It is estimated that as many as one in every five veterans who are returning are coming back with post-traumatic stress. And the reason is because of the different nature of the battle that is being fought. In previous wars, there was never a moment where people weren't contributing incredibly, but it was different in terms of engagement. It was estimated that in a, a year of service, there might be 18 or 20 or 22 days in which you would actually be engaged with the enemy. Today, when these military are serving overseas, the war fighters, they're virtually in a 24-hour high tension. And every time they leave the compound, because of the IEDs and other kinds, the changing nature of this, uh, these, these war fighters are in a mental situation in which they are entirely on guard. Because at any time, they could be put into harm's way. Many of these are, have returned from not just one or two or three, but as many as four and five tours of duty. And so what we are seeing is they are returning with this post-traumatic stress. And it carries itself out in a variety of different ways. It manifests itself in substance abuse. We've got many who are dealing with that issue, and you're seeing increased concerns about suicide. So we have done an awful lot to try to encourage the interventions to deal with this issue. One of the things that I've had the good opportunity to work on Kate has been very supportive of, uh, and in fact, we're getting great leadership on the state level, has been the development of something called Veterans Courts. It is an opportunity that I got to see a window to make a little contribution to the issue from my previous service as a district attorney. But what we're seeing with the Veterans Courts is the occasion for somebody who Whose, whose activity could pull them into the criminal justice system because of the post-traumatic stress. Guys are drinking, guys are using drugs. And sometimes they may end up in a bar and they have a fight, and the next thing you know they've been arrested and they're down there and they're in front of a district justice and they're getting ready to get run up. And we say, wait a second, let's, let's, let's hold this for a minute. What's really going on here? This is an opportunity for us to reach back and divert this guy away from the criminal justice system. Let's get him back into the veterans department where he can be availed the, the, the services of, uh, of our system to help them deal with the underlying trauma uh, that is going on right now and sometimes even the addiction that's associated with it. So working with Chief Justice uh, or, or Justice Seamus McCaffrey uh, and, and, and our DAs from around the region, uh, and we've had tremendous 
uh, participation from, from our district attorneys here uh, throughout the uh, southeastern Pennsylvania region uh, and the court systems. We've implemented what they call veterans' courts. It doesn't mean that the veteran gets a clean walk. They have to have that criminal case is put into abeyance while they go through and if they avail themselves of the treatment of the other things with the Veterans Administration and they fulfill the requirements, then the case is dismissed. If they go and they just, you know, flaunt the whole thing and just, it's a missed opportunity for them. But it also means that the case could come back and be prosecuted the normal course of business. But it gives us a chance to catch that veteran who, who, who for a variety of reasons, won't come in for the help they need. That's the opportunity we have in positions like this, to try to help them at a time where they've already paid their dues, and now it's our chance to give back to those who have given so much to us. I met Joe Rooney, and uh, he's a veteran, his wife's a veteran, and I invited him to come speak about possibilities after you leave service and what you can do with your life. And uh, he came today prepared to talk about all kinds of things, and I told him that he can talk about all kinds of things if he wants to. But I want Joe Rooney to tell you what he and his wife have been doing since they left the service, and that the possibilities for our veterans are endless because of what you learned in the service to our country. Uh, I was very fortunate when I got out uh, to uh, get hired by Delta Airlines, and I'm a captain at Delta Airlines right now. But I just want to go over two things real quick. Number one is it's really funny when you get out of the military because I look around at guys who are unbelievable, whether they're officer and enlisted guys. And you know what they're worried about? What can I do in the civilian world? Everybody undercuts what they have. In other words, their leadership abilities. If a guy says, hey, I'm a, I'm a grunt in the Marine Corps, what am I going to do out in the civilian world? And what I try and tell everybody, whether they're my peers, my sons and daughters, friends, or whatever, is that the sky literally is the limit, okay? When you come out of the military, the number one thing that you've learned first is there's amount of discipline that you learn. And I'm sorry, and I don't mean to put anybody down, you don't get it in the civilian world, okay? There are disciplined people in the civilian world, but there's a lot to be said for doing what you're told. I tell my kids that. There's much to be said. There's much value in the fact that when you tell somebody to do something, you come back, it's actually done, okay? And the second one is, what they have to realize is there's a lot to be said for having a, a, a level of service behind you. In other words, when push came to shove, you actually stood up and said, I'll do it. And I tell my kids that all the time right now. Somebody has to do it, so it might as well be me. It might as well be them. And when you get back, you realize you don't lord it over people. But there are measures in life. There are tests in life. And you know what? Somebody who's volunteered right now in a time of war and has actually said, you know what, the country needs somebody to do it, and I'll do it, there's a lot to be said about that. You have to give. When you're sitting in a military, guess what? Everybody around you does that. It's the norm. It's not the exception. When you're out here, it's the exception. All right. So I got out of the military. One real quick story. I went into uh, the S-1, the administrative section. There's a Marine back there. He would know what I'm talking about. Sorry about the jargon. But I went into admin one day, and I tell the uh, staff sergeant, hey, staff sergeant, uh, I need to talk to you about separation. And I've been married for four or five years, and he looks, he goes, oh, Captain Rooney, I'm really sorry to hear that. He thinks I'm talking about separation from my wife, okay? <laughs> In the Marine Corps, nobody thinks of getting out of the Marine Corps, okay? I said, I said, no, 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 no. I said, I'm thinking about getting out. And he was like, whoa. Colonel Mott once told me, he said, you know, Rooney, he said, everybody gets out of the military. It's just a question of when. But when you're actually in, when you say, I'm thinking about getting out, everybody's surprised and they look at you. Well, there's a whole world out there. Ultimately, I got off active duty and got into reserves. And I can talk to people, and you know it also. If you've served, there's tons of questions that you have in your mind. There's a lot of things you don't know. There's incredible resources out there. When you get off active duty, you don't even know they're there. People don't prepare you for getting out. So Kate said, what did we do? I'm very fortunate, I've led a blessed life. People ask me all the time, or they say, hey, thanks for your service. And most people will tell you, it's our honor to serve, okay? You don't have to thank me. If you want to thank somebody, go to my son, go to my daughter, go to Kate's son, go to Kathy Rushes and say, thank you for your service, because for me, it was an honor to do it. I grew up in McDevitt, went just a regular Ardsley kid, went through, and the military literally opened my eyes. It was the most wonderful thing I ever did in my life. 
We came back, and I was hired by Delta, and with a bad economy, uh, Delta was laying off a lot of pilots. And my wife and I had had a dream. And I can talk to people anywhere. There's a lot of things you need to do when you get out. You need to set goals for your life. A guy named Zig Ziglar is a motivational speaker. He's an older man right now. But he basically says, hey, set short-term, intermediate-term, and long-range goals. Short-term goals, my son's 20 years old. A short-term goal for him is a month. You know, I'm 54 years old. A short-term goal for me is like five years or eight years. So it all depends on what you do. But my wife and I had a goal that we set and we worked for many years. We wanted to sail around the world. Okay? And I know this sounds way out of the realm of possibilities, but do you know what? We're in America. The sky's the limit if you put your heart and your mind to it. So we looked around. We were able, my wife taught at the Naval Academy. We've got a lot of training on sailboats there at the Naval Academy. So uh, Delta laid a lot of people off, and I said, you know what? Uh, we've been wanting to do this, and we took some time. So uh, we were able to pool our resources. I bought a boat. I took a leave of absence and saved the guy's job who didn't want to leave the job. And, uh, we piled our five kids in a boat and we sailed around the world. So uh, we left, we were actually anchored underneath the Ben Franklin Bridge, if anybody knows where that is in the Delaware, one Easter, I said goodbye to my parents. I can, if you know the area, uh, when the vet was blown up, does anybody remember that weekend? We were sailing in Delaware that day. It's like, oh, I went to the first game at the vet. You know, I was at the last game at Connie Mack Stadium. It's like, wow, part of my life has gone by and the vet's gone. But we left here. We sailed down the East Coast as a retired military. I was actually able to go into to Guantanamo Bay. We spent a couple of weeks, and I have to tell you, the most wonderful people doing the toughest job who got nothing but bad press. It was like going to Mayberry RFD. I went in and I sat down with guys who were reservists, dentists, guys coming in doing different things, and all you hear about is the International Red Cross is condemning this and that. And I looked in, I looked at these guys working 12 hours a day. They had a thing down there, and I'm a little sidetracked. They called it the Gitmo 10. Every time a new prisoner came into Guantanamo, the first thing he did was he gained 10 pounds, OK? <laughs> I had a guy, a dentist told me I was watching the game down there with him. We were watching Notre Dame USC. And he goes, you know, Joe, a guy comes in, a prisoner, and he says, doctor, if you'll bring my wife over here, I'll stay forever. And I'm not minimizing. I'm not minimizing, okay, anything about the place down there. These people were dragged out of caves. They're our enemies, and they're going over there, and this is how they were being treated. But it's not what you would think. So it was an incredible experience to see those people down there. And over the next couple of years, we took our own four, five kids. We uh, used a lot of military training, day watches and night watches. My kids got up, actually, at uh, 1 o'clock in the morning. I'd wake my 14-year-old up and say, hey, Dash, it's time to get on duty. And there's not many parents get to do that. And uh, we sailed across the ocean. We ended up in Australia and uh, up in Malaysia. My daughter never went to high school, uh, homeschooled, was uh, accepted to the Naval Academy right out of uh, being homeschooled. One little sidebar on that, we're in uh, American Samoa with her. And when we go everywhere, we had three things we did. We had to find a laundry, because we always had a boat full of dirty clothes. We had to find a grocery store, because we were always out of food. And the third one is we found a church, because that was our link to the community. And from that, we would do all our schooling in the local libraries. A kid would meet kids or whatever. So uh, my daughter, uh, in, Guan in American Samoa, got a GED. So we went in, got a GED. She would have been back here graduating from Bishop McDevitt. Instead, she has this beautiful little plaque on her wall with these, with these American Samoan symbols, palm trees, and everything. And when she went to the Naval Academy, I said, two things that I wanted you to do. First is keep your mouth shut, because you get more time at sea than most of the junior officers that are here. But the second one is, I almost guarantee you, you're the only person at the, Amer at the Naval Academy with a GED. So it was kind of fun. So she went in there, left, we came home in uh, one month, the next month she went down to the Naval Academy and got out. And it's a long story here, but my bottom line is to tell people is, for the vets, for anybody, if you set a goal, this is the most incredible place in the world, you can achieve it. I went all over the military, was stationed in different bases, and there truly is nowhere like home, like you all know. And really, when you meet people in a foreign country and you say you're from America, Truly, they actually do still love America. And the second one is, they all go like this, America. Because they know in their heart of hearts, if they want to do the best thing for their wife and their kids, if they could just get there, they truly could live their dreams. So when you come home, don't shortchange yourself. When you come home, the sky's the limit. 
but it's just like in the military, it's up to you to take care of your life. You know, you can reach out, you can get help. There are people who are here who will help you. There are folks who actually need help. But the resources are available for you to reach out there and get them. Thank you for your time. And now for our final speaker, I have asked uh, Nancy Becker. Where's Nancy Becker? There she is, our Montgomery County Recorder of Deeds. Nancy started doing something as a service to veterans, which I believe is really a service to veterans' families. And um, she's going to talk about what her office can do uh, for veterans and their families. My job is the recorder of deeds. Uh, one of our charges is to record the veterans' DD-214s. And uh, we do that because it's an important part of, of what I do as the recorder of deeds. Last year, my grandson was in Afghanistan. He's in the Air Force. I'm very proud of him. And when he was there, I, I, you know, emailed him saying, Sean, what can I send you? What can I do? And he said, Grandma, the American people are so generous. Where I am, packages are coming every day. I want for nothing. If you want to do something for me, do something for the veterans at home. And so I thought about, what could I do as a recorder of deeds for the veterans? Well, they come in and get their DD-214s recorded, and that's a service. Uh, but we came up with this photo ID program. And uh, we issue a photo ID for our veterans, um, and we have about 130 businesses that give veterans discounts. And uh, it's amazing, because I go back to some of these businesses, and they said, you know, we did what you asked us to do, giving a veteran a discount, because you told us it was the right thing to do. But it's been amazing what our businesses not only are veterans coming in, uh, other people are coming in because they see we support our veterans. So if you haven't gotten your photo ID and you're a veteran in Montgomery County, please come in. There's some little brochures, uh, flyers on our, our table back there. Um, we're in Norristown, we're on Montgomery Plaza, which is directly across the street from the courthouse. Now, Norristown is not a really great place to park, so if you come in, go into our parking garage, tell them you're a veteran, you will park for free. So, and there's just one other thing I want to talk about. It has nothing to do with veterans, but there's a business out there that is uh, sending out letters to members of uh, residents in Montgomery County saying, you should have a copy of your deed, and yes, you should. Um, they are offering to sell it to you for anywhere from $59 to $89. And in one case, if you don't reply in 10 days, there's a $35 fine. Um, yes, you should have a copy of your deed. Please throw that letter in the trash. Come into my office, we'll give it to you for 50 cents a page. Uh, you can write in and, and get it for $5. Uh, or you can go online and get it. Um, a certified copy of your deed with the U.S. Postal Seal on it for $10.50. Certainly a lot less than this company's asking. So it's my honor to be here uh, to share a podium with Congressman Mann and my state representative, Kate Harper. Thank you all for being here. God bless all of you and God bless America. You've been watching highlights from my Veterans Breakfast and Expo. On next month's program, we'll visit with some of the vendors at the Expo to discover what services are available for our military veterans. If you need assistance with any state matter, please feel free to contact my local office or visit me on the web. That information will be shown in just a moment. Thanks for watching. Join me again for Legislative Report.